Okay, well, on to chapter five. So this one is going to be uh, talking about stereochemistries. So, so what we mean by stereochemistries is where molecules are have the atoms connected um, similarly, right? So all the groups are connected to the same carbons. However, their orientation in space is going to be slightly different. Like that. So, um, so, so the best way, best example is really your hands, right? So, so you have your fingers connected to your hands in the sort of normal, you know, they, they're right and your left hands are connected similarly. However, the way they're connected is slightly different in space, right? But then there's no way that you can actually turn this, your, your right hand, so it superimposes onto um, onto your left hand. Like that. So molecules themselves can actually be arranged similarly to that. Like that. So uh, we call this handedness. Like that. So, um, so when you have two two uh, molecules, right, that are mirror images of it, that you cannot turn to, to superimpose them itself. That means that that relationship, we call those those pair enantiomers, okay? So, so they are mirror images of each other. And we can get this uh, with carbon if it actually has four different things attached to it, so like that. So here's lactic acid, right? So you have a carbon, and you have a methyl, an OH, a carboxylic acid, and a, and a hydrogen. Uh, attached, right? So, um, so if you have these things here, right, you can have one version here. You can also have a uh, uh, the the mirror image of it, right? So you can see there there are mirror images of it. But there's no way that I can actually turn this, right? So that they're actually superimposed on on top of each other. Okay, and so these things are considered these mirror images are considered enantiomers. Okay, so you can so this is going to arise when you have a carbon. That has four distinct things, four different things hanging on, right? So like that. So okay. So like that. So again, you know, if I could turn it, you know, if I turned it like this, right? You know, the the blue and the green balls are different, right? But if I wanted to get the balls all on the same side, right? Well, now this methyl group or this this hydrogen here is pointed in the wrong direction, right? So I could do this, right? But the hyd but the hydrogens are pointed incorrectly. There's no way that I can just turn this. To get it to superimpose, and that means that these that these two compounds are considered enantiomers. <clears throat> okay, so this ability to do um, to have four different things on it, and and having this the special property is called chirality. It actually comes from the Greek word, um, the Greek word for hand. Okay, it means that you have this non-identical mirror image to it. So, what makes a molecule chiral? Well, if you look at something like <clears throat> Propionic acid, which is not chiral, if you look down the sort of backbone, so here's you know carbon, carbon, carbon right here. This what's on the left side is exactly the same as on the right side, right? So there's this nice plane of symmetry that goes right through this molecule. Okay, you can see you can see, you can see it here. For something like lactic acid, which is chiral, what's happening is right, so this side. The right side is different than the left side, so, so you can, there's not this mirror image. There's no plane of symmetry that goes through this molecule. Okay, so so not, not this way, not this way. Um, there's no plane of symmetry. When you don't have this plane of symmetry, um, that's when you could have a chiral molecule. <clears throat> so how do you find a chiral um, a chiral center? Well, for carbon, it's going to have four different groups attached to it. Okay, so with that, so when you're do, looking at this, what you to do is you start at the carbon of interest and then you go out one atom right so you can look at look at those okay if those are if you have two groups that are the same that doesn't necessarily mean that the um, so if you have two carbon atoms it doesn't necessarily mean they're um, they're the same right so what we need to do is the entire group that's hanging off of it so what you do is you go out one atom at a time until you find a difference or you come to the end of the chain come to the end of the chains and they're the same um, you have a spider difference, that means it's the same, it's not chiral. But, it, but as soon as you can find a, a difference going one atom out at a time, then you can say this whole side is different from this whole side. And, and we'll go through some examples on the next slide. Okay, so, so here we go. So, so we have a, uh, <coughs> so, so here we go. So we have this carbon, okay, we've got hydrogen, a fluorine, this group here. And this group. All right, so we're actually interested in in that carbon there, and do, and does this carbon have four different groups on it? Well, 
and see. So just look directly attached to this carbon. Well, there's a hydrogen, there's a fluorine, and then there's these two carbons. Okay, so we at least have this one and this one. All right, but these we don't know. So, um, right? Even though the carbon, this side could be different than that side, which is totally fine. So like that. So this is what we do: is we say, okay, um, when you when you do this, right? So you have a CH2 and a CH2, right? Well, that's the same. Okay. So then what you do is you go out one, you go out one carbon further, right? And then you compare that to that, and now you've got a CH2 versus a CH3. Well, there is a difference now. So that means that this group here is different than this group here. So now we've got our first four things, right? We have this hydrogen, the fluorine, this three carbon piece, a propyl group, okay, and then this two carbon piece, a uh, um, an ethyl group, right? So so this carbon has four distinct things hanging off it, four different things hanging off it. So this is considered chiral. Okay. So I'm gonna try this one. All right, so here I'm gonna go ahead and draw draw these out because it'd be a little bit easier to see. Right, so these are CH2 groups, right? You see you have two bonds shown, so that means carbon needs four bonds, right? So you so there must be two hydrogens hit that, that are not shown. They're not hidden, they're just not shown. Like that. Okay, so we're actually interested in that carbon there, right? So um, so we say, okay, well we got a hydrogen and a chlorine, right? So da 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 da. And then we have the CH2 group and a CH2 group. Okay, so they're the same. So Okay, so, so we gotta go, we have to move one carbon out, right? So then we can pair this and this. What well, CH2, CH2? Well, that's the same. And then we get back here, right, to this CH2. Right? So they sort of fall back into it. So, so, so that they both have the exact same CH2. Okay. So what that means is that this side is exactly the same as that side. Okay. Since so this is this side is the same as this side of of the ring then that means this carbon only has actually three different things hanging off of it, so now this is not chiral. Another way we could say it is achiral. Okay, so, so since this side is the same as this side of the ring, so this side of the ring is the exact same side as that, exact same thing as that side of the ring, that means that they're not, there's not two distinct sides, or there's, these are not, these are the exact same thing, so they're not chiral. So there you go. <coughs> okay. Next up. So if a, if a uh, a molecule has um, has this has a chiral center in it, usually what we call it is called act, optically act, um, optically ah, <laughs> excuse me optically active. Now there's some special cases and we'll talk about that in a minute. But for the most part, if it has a chiral center, in it, it'll actually have this very quirky property um, where it'll actually um, turn plain polarized light. Okay, so when, when you have a light bulb, right, some sort of um, regular light source, I'm in mean there, the, the light will come at you in waves, but it could be this way and this way or this way or whatever, right? So what you do is you put it through a filter, right? And it only allows um, certain, um, one type of wave to come through, right? So, so it could be like this, right? When that's, so this is, the, this is how polarized sunglasses work, right? So the ones that come across, that come at you like this, give rise to glare, um, and so it, the a polarizer will filter those out, okay? So it's only coming out, instead of all directions, it's actually only coming out in one type of direction. But when you put a sample, right, so you dissolve your sample and put it in here and send that light through it, it'll actually turn this, the, um, if the light starts off like this, it'll actually turn it from, you can analyze it after the, um, at the other end, and, it, and if it has this chiral center, it'll do that, it'll turn those lights. But that's just one, and so because it's actually uh, messing with the light, right? The optical properties of the light they we call it optically active. Okay, and so there's two different ways. So, so before they really understood what was going on, they they were able to observe this um, this phenomenon. Okay, and so what they did is they just threw everything they could at it, um, and, and to see what bent light and what didn't, and, you know, which way. And it turned out that it, sometimes it'll bend it counterclockwise. Okay, and we say that that's um, that has level rotary activity to it, so L. So we give it the, either the L or the minus sign, so it's bent this way. So if you dissolve morphine in there, it, it has 
uh, it's typically going to be the L morphine. All right, so if you dissolve morphine in there, sent light through it, it would bend it counterclockwise if it started off like this. Now, now if it bent it clockwise, it's called dextrorotary. Okay, so with that, and usually for the D. So with that, so it'd be D camphor. So camphor, if you put it in there, it bends it clockwise. So with that, so, so this is this is just a general property of, of the molecules. It doesn't necessarily say anything about the. Uh, uh, just says something about the overall orientation of the molecule. You have the D version of the camphor. Now there is an L version of the camphor, right? If you put the L version in there, you could, it would bend it the other way. Like that. So, uh, but this is just saying to indicate which version of this you have, which enantiomer you have, either the D, or the L, which would also be indicated by the plus, or the L, which would be indicated by the minus. Okay, so enantiomers, right? So, so, um, so they were actually first um, first discovered um, by Louis Pasteur the, of pasteurization fame. So he was working with this, so this um, tartrate actually became a uh, exceedingly important molecule in the 17th and 19th century. So this is actually comes from the inside of um, wine casks. You get this white powder that forms up, right? Um, tartar from you know, hard. Um, so he had this this compound here, it's ammonium, um, sodium ammonium tartrate. He, he made this version. So, and so when he had this molecule, right? So he had both the D and the L versions in there. When you do that, it actually they both cancel the rotations out, so it comes out. So the light, even though you're sending plain polarized light through it, the you know some molecules turn this way, some molecules turn this way, and eventually just cancels cancels each other out. Well, he crystallized this, and then looked at the crystals under the microscope, and he found two different forms. Okay, so and they and he described them like this, and notice how they are mirror images of each other. Okay, so what he did is he physically took, separated out the individual the crystals that look like this, put them in one jar, took the ones that look like this, and put it in another jar. Okay, so then he dissolved that up. I noticed that this version was the D version. When you dissolved it up, stuck it in a polarimeter or to measure the, how much it turned to light, it bent it this way. He took this one. This was the L version. And it bent that way, and so he said. Even though he, so what this was saying is that, even if you have a sample that doesn't that doesn't bend light, if you have both the D and the L version in there, right? They will, um, they will. Um, the reason why it's not bending light is because they're canceling each other out. Okay, so he's able to first show this. Okay, so what we want to do, right? So the first thing we usually do when, um, you know, we we learn about a concept is, is give it a name. And so what they wanted to do, what scientists decided they wanted to do was to um, was come up with a naming scheme so that you know exactly how these these atoms are oriented in space. Okay, so how so in this one here, how the the H, the F, the methyl, the propyl, excuse me, the ethyl and the propyl groups are arranged in space. And so what we do is we actually give these um, these names, right? So we're going to give these. Um, an R or S designation, right? But we need to figure out how to determine if it's the R or the S version. Okay, so the first thing is we do is we usually use these Kahn Engel prelog, prelog rules. Okay, and so um, the uh, and, and so technically it's um, you rank the atoms according to the atomic number, um, but really the easiest thing to think about is weight, right? So with that, so if the same atomic number, the heavier it weighs, right? So pretty much going to be there's some technical reasons why you can't have it needs to be atomic number, but pretty much it's going to be the heavier the atom, the higher the priority. Okay, so like that. So, so right. So as the as the atoms get smaller, right, they they lose in priority. They go down in priority. Okay. Okay. And so they talk about atoms and furthest away and things like that. But the the easiest way that I could describe it to say which one's fourth. And so we're going to rank these as one, two, three, four around here. Okay. And so what we're actually going to do, the easiest thing to do is if you have a tie. Okay, and you can talk about bonding rules and things like that. Which actually, the easiest thing to do is to actually look at what is the bonds that each of these. So, like there was a tie here, right? So if he here, so for this one, right, this would be this would be number one, right? The next the next one would be carbon, carbon, right? So that's the next heaviest, and then hydrogen would be four, right? The the to know which one's two and three, what you actually do is you actually look at which one. Look at the bonds, okay? Like so, this one has two carbon-carbon bonds, and this one has two carbon-carbon bonds, and then you compare, and then this one has two hydrogens, two hydrogens. You you compare the the heaviest thing that's coming off there, and the more heavy bonds you have, the 
easier it is to figure out. All right, the, 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 excuse me, the more heavy stuff you have, atoms you have bonded to it, um, the, uh, the higher priority it gets. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a minute, stuff like that. So that's actually what this is saying. Okay, now, once you've set up the one, two, three, four, right, so this would actually be, um, end up being two, three, and we'll talk about that in a minute, why. Okay, so the other thing is, as soon as you come to a, to a difference that you can actually um, determine the difference, it, you stop. It does not matter if the, uh, um, if the atom, um, you know, if, if the chain is longer or whatever. I'm going to talk about that. Okay, I'm going to make sure we talk about that. So, so uh, for the priorities, we always go until that decision cannot, um, you go one atom away, right? So just like this, until you find a difference and then you stop. Okay, so um, so for this one here, all right, so that's the chiral center. All right, so these two are the chiral centers. So if you have CH2, um, CHF, CH3, right, versus CH2, 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 C, like this, right? So we have these, ooh, we have these, it's, it's longer, we have these big heavy oxygens at the end, we've got multiple bonds here, but, um, right, so what we do, if we we look at this one, right? These are the same, they're both CH2s, right? But this one here, right? We have a CF bond, that's, um, two carbon-carbon bonds, right? And a CH bond. This one here, right? So we're looking at that one versus that one. This one has two carbon-carbon and two carbon-hydrogens, right? So we're actually comparing the fact that this has a really heavy bond, um, well, this one doesn't, right? So this has a CF bond. This one only has CC bonds. So this one actually has the higher priority. It does not matter, higher or lower. It does not matter that this is longer. You have to be disciplined about this. Okay, you start here. There's not a change. You go here. Oh, there is a change. Now we're going to stop. Okay, so you keep going out just like we did here. Going out and, and, and until we get, until we find the change and then we're done. The number of bonds is, is that's sort of what we're doing here, right? But that, so, okay, so how do we figure out R and S? Okay, so, so we're going to figure out 1, 2, 3, 4. Okay, so, so here we go. So this is, um, so, so what you do, so you can, there's two primary methods that, that I teach, um, and you can do either one. If there's another method you want to use that, that's easier for you, go ahead and use it. It's just whatever you, it, it's easier for you to visualize. Okay, so, so here we go. So this is, um, Okay, so this this configuration here, right, is the uh, um, is this one on the right? Or excuse me, this one on the left here. So that's it. so we go one, two, three, four. Okay, so what you want to do is you want to make sure that the that the um, that the number four. So in this case, right, the number four group is going away from you. Okay, so with that, so and then you go one, two, three, right? One, two, three. So so the one, two, three is going clockwise here so this is um, so this is considered R right so it's a steering wheel like you're know, turning to the right so it would be considered R so clockwise is R okay with four going away from you okay so for this configuration it's actually this one here right so blue uh, blue is in the plane this is going up the uh, um, two is coming out at you the red is going behind right so we need to again turn the four, so it's going away from us, right? So it looks like this, so one, two, three, right? So it's going around like this. So, so since this is, you would, um, since it's going counterclockwise, it's going, um, it, it, it's considered S, so like that. So, but don't forget, it's always going, the four has to be going away from you, okay? So like that. Now, the other method we can do is the, the one I like because I can I don't need to redraw the molecules is actually the handed method, okay? And so, uh, and so what you do is so, so for this one here the R version, right? So you rank them one, two, three, four. What you do is you have your hand um, and you have your fingertip. So your thumb actually points wherever four is. So it doesn't matter if it's here, you have it's here, it's down there, there. Right, so that so, so what you do is and then you have your fingertips trace out where one, two, three goes. Right, so, so so here we go. Right, so um, so if this was one, two, three like this, right, 
you would trace out one, two, three, with with, with your since your the, the since your thumb is pointing where uh, where the four is, right? So you would trace one, two, three. Okay. So about that. So, so since you're using your right hand, this is R. Since right, because if I tried to use my left hand to do this, right, four going this way, okay. one, two, and then I'd have to break my my fingers in order to do it, right? To get to get the three. Okay. So, so it naturally your your right hand is naturally going to sweep from one, two, three, like this. Uh, with your thumb pointing towards four, so, so it's R. Okay, so, so instead, right, you have this one here, right? So it'd be, um, right, one, two, three, like this. Oop, wrong way. I remember we, how we did this before. So. Get my numbers right. Here we go. One, two, three, like this. Sorry about that. I got this out. Okay. So now one, two, three. I have to remember which one, which, which ball, what color. All right. So now, right, the, uh, the the your thumb is pointed out at four, right, and then you sweep with your fingertips. One, two. Here's those numbers. One, two, three, like that. Since you're using your left hand, that's an S. So you can use either one. So, okay. So here, here's the question for you. Okay. So here we're gonna we're gonna to, to determine what if this is R or S. Okay. So here's the here's the um, here's the carbon, right? So, so we have the fluorine, we have the hydrogen, and the plane, right? So CH two. CH3, right, and that's going away. CH2, CH2, CH3. Okay, so here we go. So, so we're gonna say so we're interested in that that chiral center there. Okay, so so we have which is fluorine, hydrogen, carbon, carbon. Okay, so, so of these, right, so this is the heaviest, right? Fluorine's the heaviest, so it'd be number one. This one is either the carbons in the next heaviest, right? So carbon, carbon. We don't know which one's two or three at this point. So, but we do know that hydrogen is the lowest, so that's definitely going to be four. So, so we have to figure out which one's two and which one's three. Okay, so again, so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the bonds. Okay, so that carbon has two carbon-carbon bonds, right? So one, two, right there, and two carbon hydrogens, right? This one here has has two carbon-carbon, right? So one, two, and two carbon hydrogen bonds, right? So it's a tie. So, okay, so what do we do? We go out one more atom, right? So we, we then look at this one versus this one, right? So this one here has, um, already has two carbon-carbon bonds, right? And two carbon-hydrogens. This one here, see this one only has the one carbon-carbon bond, and it has three carbon-hydrogens, right? So we compare the, the number of carbon-carbon bonds, right? Because that's the heaviest thing hanging off of it. This has two, this has one, so therefore this has this has the higher priority. Okay. And this so this would be three. So, so I just I like to draw this, this out so we get rid of all the, the drawing. Right? Oops. Four, one, two, three, two. Okay. So here we go. So so it's actually gonna look like this. Oh no, actually it's this one. This is this is usually one. This is two. This is three. Right? So, like that. so the one is sticking. The four is the one is sticking up. Right? Four is this way. Right? Three is coming this way. Two is going back. Okay. Okay. So in order to do the steering wheel method, we're going to have to turn this like that. Okay. So, so when that happens, right? So when that happens, the one stays where it is. The three goes to this side, and the two comes over here, right? So the two stays there, the three swings over here, and the one stays where it is, and then the four goes behind, okay? So you're looking at it going this way, right? So with four, with four going behind, right, 
that means that it's going clockwise, so it's R. Okay, now if you're going to do the steering wheel method, right, so, right, or the, I'm sorry, the, the thumb method, right, so the four was this way, three was coming out, two was behind, so, um, so let's see, if I, see if I can do this, right, so, so my right hand. So, yeah, I'm sorry, it's like that. Okay, so, so one is three, Three is here, two is there, one is there, right? So you, you need to go one, two, three, right? So since you're curling around like this, one, two, three, with your four sticking out like that, two, three. Okay, so either way you're going to be using your right, your right hand. So it does so. Okay? It does so. Let's do, the, uh, let's do the next example. Okay, so this is another way that you can do this. Okay, so... We have your um, car chiral carbon here, right? So you have, right? So it's a car. I'm just gonna go ahead and draw on the atoms, CH3, right? So there's a carbon here, right? And then there, that's a CH3 group. Okay. So this one here, CH2, going down to OH. Right? You have D going out here and the H going here. Okay. So, so here we go. So we're gonna compare this carbon, this carbon, this hydrogen, and this deuterium, right? So a hydrogen is just it's just a proton, right, with um, with no with no neutrons. Deuterium is actually a, uh, a hydrogen with a mass of two, so it has a, a proton, which makes it a hydrogen plus a neutron, right, to give it an extra. So, so right, so we have a carbon carbon, right. So those are going to be the heaviest, right. But but since this one here, right, is is heavier than that one, this one becomes the three and the four, right. So we know this is going to be one or two. Right? These are both hydro types of hydrogen, so they would be three and four. But since this one's a little heavier than this one, this one gets the higher priority. Okay, so now we need to figure out this one. Okay, so, so this one here, right, it has two carbon carbon bonds, right? So one, two, right? And two carbon oxygen bonds, right? One, two. This guy here, right, it only has one carbon carbon bond, right? So just right there. One carbon oxygen, right, and two carbon hydrogen bonds, right? So you compare the heaviest bond, right, which is this one, this one, and that one, right? This one has two carbon oxygen bonds, right? This one only has one, right? So that, that gives this the higher priority than that. Okay, so if you redraw this, right, so, right, so one, two, three, four, right? So here, if you're doing the steering wheel, right, so it'll go like, right, so with four going behind, right, so four is going back, right, so it's going counterclockwise, right, so like that, so this would be S, okay. So here, right, so if this is one, two, three, the four going here, right, so your thumb's pointed down, right, so it'd be one, two, three. You're doing the thumb method. So, yes. Okay, last one. Okay, so this is a little more complicated. Okay, so you have this, right? I'm going to go ahead and draw the carbons. Just so it's a little easier to see. Okay. We're actually interested just in in that carbon there. Okay, and if you notice, this carbon only has three bonds shown, right? So that means there has to be a, a hydrogen in there, right? It's an un, unshown hydrogen, right? So like that. But remember, with these these things, right? We have two two bonds that are in the plane. We have one wedge and one dashed. So we already showed the the two that are in the plane and one wedged, or excuse me, one dashed. So that means that the hydrogen that's not shown must be a wedge, right? It doesn't matter if it's actually tilted to the um, to the left or the right. It'll still give you the same results. But but don't forget that there's this un, unwritten hydrogen that's also here. It has to be the wedge, right? Because we already see the the, um, the dash behind. Okay, so here we go. So we need to do the priority, right? So it's this carbon versus this carbon versus this carbon versus this hydrogen. Well, the carbons are going to be are heavier, right? So there's so one's going to be one, two, three. The hydrogen's going to be four. Okay, but 
we don't know at this point what exactly it is, right? So but we know that that's four. Okay, so, so what do we do? Well, we do what we always do, right? We compare the bonds, right? So that one, right, it has two carbon-carbon, two carbon-hydrogen, right? That guy there has right, two carbon-carbon, right? Um, two carbon-hydrogens. Right? This one here, right, it has four, one, two, three, four carbon-carbon bonds, right? right? So this, so you compare Carbon, 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 right? So there we go. We found a difference. So this has to be number one. Okay. So that means one of these have to be two and three, right? So, but there's a tie here, right? So what do we do? We go out one extra carbon, right? So now we're comparing this carbon with this carbon, right? So this carbon, right, has one, two, three carbon, carbon bonds and one carbon hydrogen, right? This one here. It's two carbon carbon and two carbon hydrogen, right? Again, we're going to look at the heaviest bond here and versus here, right? This has three, this has two. So that means that this side here has, um, this side is the two, and that means this side is the three. Okay, so if you're going to rewrite this, right? So, with just the numbers, right? So this would be, this side is the three, this side is the two, Four, which is the hydrogen coming out at you, and this is here, right? One here. Okay, so right, so so it's looking like that. Okay, and you say, oh well, it's going counterclockwise, so it's so it must be S. But you have to remember which way that the four is pointing. The four is pointing out at you. To do the steering wheel method, it has to be rotating behind. Okay, so. Like that. so so what we right so right now right, so let me orient this correctly right so now the three three two one here right so these two are in the plane and four is coming out at you one is coming um, four is coming out at you one is going behind so what we're going to do is we're going to just flip this okay so now the molecule looks like this right so two and three have flipped. And then one and four have flipped. Four, right? So now, now it's going this way. Now it's going Now it's going clockwise. So it's R. Okay. Can you do the steering wheel method, right? So, so maybe like this, right? So the your right thumb would be. So, so it'd be down here, right? So like that one, two, three, right? Because the thumb has to be uh, pointed out at you. So it'd be one is down here, two, three, right? one, two, three, and three. I know I sort of move my hand, right? But I'm trying not to break my wrist. Um, but the four is always pointed out. The thumb is always pointed the way the four is. Okay. So since you're using your your right hand to sweep around. It's the R version, okay? Now what's interesting about this, okay, so, so here we go, so RSR, okay? Now, the interesting thing is that one of the other quirky things about uh, in antimers is that it's not just how they then polarize light, it's also how they interact with other chiral molecules that can be different, okay? So, so this is L, excuse me, r limoline, which smells like citrus. The receptors in your nose are made of proteins. Those are made out of chiral compounds, right? So, so the way that the R is going to interact with your nose, it's going to smell like citrus. The S version, so the enantiomer of this, is actually smells like pine. Okay, so since there's two chiral inter things interacting with each other, right, they, uh, they're going to um, react slightly differently, right? So this one, this one smells like pine, the mirror image of it smells, or excuse me, this one smells like citrus, the mirror image smells like pine. So. Okay, so, so we talked about, right, the mirror, mirror image of Right? But what if you had more than one chiral center and not all of them are switched, right? So, so, so here, right, so we talked about um, this one here going from R to S, okay? But what if you, to make the enantiomer, right, you have to actually switch, switch to the S, right? But what if you hold this one fixed and only fixed, and you had a second one over here and you switch this one but not held this one fixed? Now it's not the mirror image of each other. That, when that happens, they're actually 
considered what are called diastereomers. Okay, so I'll show you how this works. Okay, so you have two two chiral centers here. Okay, so you have an RR character, right? Okay, so we determined those were RR. Now to make the to make the enantiomer, what we do is we actually have to switch all of them to make the mirror image. So you have to switch all the R's and all the S's, right? So it goes from RR to SS. Okay, but what happens if we fix the the first one and switch the second one? We make the RS. Now these because we haven't switched them all. They are diastereomers. That, that's what we call them. Okay, but that. So if we had, um, right? So if we had, um, and so if we had 20, 20 R stereocenters, right? To make the enantiomer, enantiomer, right? What would it need to be? It need to be. You need, you need to switch them all to S, right? But what if instead we had twenty Rs, right? And we um, did 19 S's and kept one of them fixed, it would be a diastereomer. All right, this would be an enantiomer. Right. What if we did, um, you know, 10 S's and 10 R's, right? Again, we'd have a diastereomer. If we held, um, if we took 19 of these and held them fixed, right, but we only switched one of them, okay, this, again, it's a diastereomer. Actually, this is somewhat of a special case. This is actually called an epimer. If there's only one, only one switched. Okay, that's sort of a special case, but it is technically a diastereomer. Okay, so my dad's. So this is a special case where you have, where you have 19. You won't, you only switch one of them. Okay, but you keep the rest of them fixed. That's considered an epimer, but that's. Um, um, but it is technically at the diastereomer. Okay. Now, one of the quirks of diastereomers, all right. So with enantiomers, right, they um, they're going to have the same properties, right? So they so they are the SS versus the RR. They're going to have the same melting point, boiling point, solubility, whatever. Okay. Except how they turn the plane polarized light and how they interact with other chiral molecules, right? Remember that the limonene case. One smells like citrus. One smells like pine. Like that. So those are the exceptions, right? But for diastereomers, okay, they actually have, so if you had to compare the SS versus the SR, they're actually going to have slightly different properties, right? So they have different melting temperatures, different boiling points, different, slightly different solubilities. They're probably going to be similar, but they're going to be, there is going to be differences in solubility. Um, so, so, um, right, so remember, enantiomers are the exact same light, and the exact same properties, uh, except for two kind of quirky ones, and then, but diastereomers are going to have Different, um, different properties themselves. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, a weird class of molecules. Okay, so that that they do have chiral centers in them, right? Like that, but um, but they're not considered chiral. So like that. So okay. So like that. So um, okay. So what happens is the uh, um, what will happen is right. So remember when we were talking about um, dipole moments. Okay, so when we had this, you know, this compound and this compound, right? So we, we would say, well, we've got a polar bond, it goes this way, polar bond, it goes this way, right? And then the overall dipole would be here, right? But sometimes, right, so you can get these, you still have polar bonds, right? Um, you still have polar bonds, right? But there's no dipole. Um, no dipole overall, right? Because it kind of cancels it out. This is sort of similar, sort of a, it's not, it's a similar concept to here, right? Where you have, where you can have chiral centers here, right? So there's a chiral center here, 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 here. And there's four things hanging off of it, right? But the overall molecule itself is not chiral. Why? Because if you were to take this, take the mirror image and just rotate it, you can actually get something that's over, um, that is um, um, superimposable. Okay, and so and so why is this? It's because it has because it has a plane of symmetry to it, right? So this have the molecule is exactly the exact mirror image of this mole, uh, this molecule, or this half of the molecule, right? So because you've got this weird plane of symmetry, you end up with this um, this quirky uh, this quirky nature, right? And actually this is not chiral, and actually they don't bend um, polarized light, so like that. So I'll, I'll show you how this works. Okay, so okay, so so. If, we have a molecule here saying, is it, 
is it chiral or is it meso? Okay, so how do you figure it out? Well, first thing you do is you look for a plane of symmetry, right? So if you're looking for this, this molecule here, right? Okay, you can actually, you can kind of see this, this plane of symmetry going right through there, right? So this half the molecule is that half the molecule, right? And you can actually see that, okay, uh, if you make the enantiomer, right? So if you're going to make the enantiomer, right, so, right, so, so, right, so here's our molecule. Okay, so the, the two OH groups, right? So assuming those are OH groups, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make the enantiomer, which is this one here, assuming that the, um, right, so the groups are here, right? So, so they're mirror images of each other. But the nice thing is I can actually rotate this, this blue one, so that these groups are sitting right on top of each other. Okay, so they're, they're mirror. I can make the mirror image, but the mirror image is superimposable. Okay, so that makes it easy. Okay, and why is it meso? It's because it has this plane of symmetry. So this one's actually meso. Okay, but what happens if we just switch the stereochemistry of one? Right? So what about this one? We hold this one here, so we make the, the diastereomer of it. Right? So, so right, so we can still make um, right. So we have this one up, this one down. Right. So now we're going to make this molecule. Okay, and if we want to make um, the enantiomer of it, right? Because there's there might be a plane of symmetry here, but we don't know yet. So what you're going to do, you want to make the mirror image of it, right? So that's the mirror image, right? Now, is there a way that we can rotate this this one with the blue balls to get on top of the red, red balls? Uh, no. See, because if we have these in the same place, right? We got a blue ball and a red ball over here. So well, what if we do this and that? There's no way that I can turn this so that the enantiomer is, is superimposable. So because of that, there's no plane of symmetry. And so this one's chiral, right? It's not meso, right? There's no plane of symmetry here. Okay, now for this next one, right? so, okay, so this one's called a spiral compound, right? So you actually have two rings Used as a single at a single carbon. It actually, it looks like this. Okay, like that's so one ring versus the other ring. Okay, and so what you would look for, right, is you, is, is there a plane of symmetry here? No, right, because this this part of the molecule is not the same as this, right, because of that CH three, right, and same thing here. There's no right, so that's not right. What about this plane of symmetry? No, nope, that's not it because there's the, again this if you're trying to mirror, put a mirror here, right? This side of the molecule is not the same as this, right? Because of that CH3 group. So again, we don't have a plane of symmetry, so this is considered chiral. It's not meso. Okay, so the last one, right? So we have this, right? So we have this compound here, right? Okay, Okay, remember with these with these um, with single bonds, right? You can get free rotation, right? Oops, I'm sorry, this is a, this is a problem. You can get free rotation, right? So like that, just like with your model kit, right? So if you have a regular carbon-carbon bond, right? If it's in a ring, you can only get some flexing, but for a regular one, right, you can get this free rotation. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to hold this this carbon fixed here, right? So I'm going to hold that fixed. I'm going to rotate around that bond. Okay, I'm just going to rotate so that this hydrogen is down here. Right? So that moves that guy over here and that guy over there. And notice how there's a nice plane of symmetry going right there. Okay, so this this half of the molecule is a, just a mirror image of this this half of the molecule. Since there's a plane of symmetry, it's it's meso, right? So Again, this carbon right has a bromine, a methyl, a hydrogen, and this big group on here. 
like this one, right? So these are both chiral carbons, right? But the molecule itself is not chiral because it has this plane of symmetry. So all I did is rotate around this bond here, right, to the point where I can see that plane of symmetry. It's easy to see that plane of symmetry. Okay, when you have that plane of symmetry, um, it's, a, it's a meso compound. Okay. Okay, next up. So racemic mixtures, okay? So, so what happens if you have... Um, in antimers, right? So, that's, so if you have an antimers, right, they're going to have the same, um, they're going to have the same properties. Okay, so, um, okay. so right, some like of that. So, but if you have a mixture of them, right, it's called a racemate or a racemic mixture. Okay, so you have both the D and the L version in there, right? So, so sometimes if you have this, right, it's sometimes indicated as a DL or a plus minus. Right? So it's not going to, to do the polarized light, right? Because this one here is going to rotate at this one, and then the light's going to interact with an L, and then it's going to rotate it back, and then this one here, and then back. It's just going to cancel each other out. Okay, so it actually, you know that you have a racemic mixture because it doesn't cancel out, because it, um, it, it doesn't rotate the polarized light. Okay, so the question is, so you have a, a, uh, the, D, um, the DNL mixture, okay? So how do you, if you want just one of them, how do you how do you get them, how do you separate them? Well, if you remember, so when everything is the same, right? So if we have the if we want to separate out the R versus the S in antimer, right? So let's say we're interested in, the, in isolating the R lactic acid. Okay, so what we do is we actually uh, what we can do is we can interact it with we can react it with a another molecule that has a fixed chiral center. Okay, so when these two react, we get the RR version. When we react with this one here, we only provide the R. So now, when these two react, we have the SR version. Now, notice we only change the difference between the RR and the SR is one chiral center change. When that happens, that's right. So these are diastereomers now. In order for this to be an antimer, right, we had to we have to have the SS. But since we have diastereomers now, now they have different properties to it, right? So this can be slightly so, slightly more soluble in, in methanol than this one here. So we can actually use the, those differences between the, uh, the enantiomers to separate this out. When when we separate out the, the, R, the RR version, right, we can then strip away, right, because it's just a salt, we strip away this here and then we'll be left with the R lactic acid, right? So, we, so if you want to separate out um, an R and an S enantiomer, what you have to do is you have to make it into a temporary diastereum, mixture of diastereomers. So do the separation and then remove that second, that second, that added um, chiral center to it. Okay, so so that's how you do. It. Okay, so chirality in nature. Okay, so it's not just carbon, right? So it's actually can actually happen for nitrogen. You can have several different ones, but nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur are, are common ones. Okay, and so what we do is we actually can do this. We actually consider the lone pair itself to be a um, uh, to be a group. Okay, so this one here, right? So hydrogen, methyl, or excuse me, methyl, ethyl, and then the lone pair. Okay, so these are considered four different groups, right? But the nice thing for hydrogen is now it weighs more than that that lone pair, right? Because electrons are really really tiny, um, stuff like that. So it weighs more than that, right? So now this is now it gets to be three. This is one of the few times where hydrogen isn't the lowest priority, right? So now the, the lone pair is, right? So one, two, three, right? So, um, right, so, right, so one, two, three, right? So, so you can do this um, with that, and you end up getting, this is the R version, okay? You want to practice that, okay? But this group is just considered like any other um, lowest priority before. Okay, the problem with, with, um, with nitrogen is that the, is that these, these lone pairs can actually squirt to the other side, and when that happens, they can actually spontaneously go to the other side of this nitrogen. When that happens, it pops everything back, right? So it's like an umbrella popping and popping, inverting in the wind, right? So when it, when these guys pop spontaneously pop over on this side, the, this moves everything over here, right? So this is actually um, the inversion is actually rapid, complete room temperature, right? So at cryogenic temperatures, you can actually isolate this. As soon as you get to room temperature, it's going to start, it's going to start inverting back and forth, right? So if you isolate the R version at low temperatures, 
um, cryogenic temperatures, as soon as you warm it up, you're going to have a mixture of iron acid. There's nothing you can do about it. Okay, so this inversion is rapid. However, the, for essen, the, for the for sulfur and phosphorus, you get the same situation, but this inversion is very, very slow. Okay, and so you can actually isolate these um, these versions here. So you can actually isolate the R version here and the S version here. Okay, so this S here is the stereochemistry. This S here, the second S, is actually indicate that the um, uh, this, that the adenosyl group is actually attached to the sulfur of the methionine. That's actually what that means. Um, so like that. So so it's actually the S uh, S version of the S adenosyl methionine. So like that. So you can actually do this. And actually, this is a billion dollar problem. Okay. Um, if you look at the case of omeprazole, which is most people know as either Prilosec or Nexium. Okay. So there's actually in this in this configuration, sulfur actually has a set of lone pairs here, which you can actually see right there. So for the um, so when they were originally developing uh, omeprazole as Prilosec, okay, they just had the RS racemate. Okay. So they had both that where where the uh, lone pairs was, was going behind. Right? And then another version where these two um, these two groups were switched, right? So the, this one had the uh, um, the wedges and dashes were switched. That's how you make your resume. Okay. And so what they did is they said, okay, this was coming off patent in 2001. Okay. So then and anybody could sell it as long as they had FDA approval. Um, but as before, only AstraZeneca could sell it. Okay. So what they did is they went back and they isolated the more reactive of the two. It turns out the S enantiomer here. In this configuration is the slightly more reactive okay and so what they did is they bottled this up and they they submitted it to the FDA and they said look if we just give them the S in the enantiomer it actually works a little bit better than, than this version the FDA said yeah looks like it does um, some of that so they were able to ex um, just sell this single isomer the S that's what the ES comes from S and the result because it's the S enantiomer right as Nexium Okay, and so they were able to make billions and billions of extra dollars, right? Because they were able to essentially extend the patent life for this molecule by just doing this single enantiomer. Okay, and so until 2014, now, 2012, the peak sales were which peak sales were about four billion dollars. So just by isolating the single isomer, this is um, they were able to extend out the patent life, right? So this is a process, a very controversial process called evergreening. Um, in the pharmaceutical industry where you make a slight change to a molecule to extend out the patent line and, and protect the uh, sales. So, okay, so, so um, right, so, so the next thing is um, with uh, chirality is what's called prochirality, okay? And so this is where you have a, a molecule without a chiral carbon, right? But it could be a carbon. It could be a chiral if you do a, a, a chemical step to it, okay? Or if you made a slight change to it. Okay, so if we made, so if we had 2-butanone here, if we just, if we did a uh, reaction here to make it into 2-butanol, we reduced it, um, right? So now it's chiral, right? So like that, you go from, right, three things on it to now four different things hanging off of it, right? So when you do, when you do one, one step, it becomes chiral, okay? So that means that it could be chiral, stuff like that, so, okay? And so you can see this um, with sp2 and sp3 carbons, okay? So for sp2... Um, what you do is you, um, so uh, you have different faces, right? Because sp2s are typically flat, okay? So like that. So um, and so you can have one face versus the other. How do we differentiate those two? Okay. And so what we do is we, if we have a molecule like this, like the two butanone, okay. What we would do is we would actually say. Um, we would do the normal priority rules of saying, you know, one, two, three. And it, as you look at the face, if the one, two, three goes clockwise, it would be um, that would normally, um, it's considered the, the ray face. If you're, um, if it's looking clockwise, um, if the one, two, three went clockwise, it would be the C face, right? So if you're, um, if you were, you know, sitting on the floor looking up at this molecule, right, the one, two, three would actually look clock, um, counterclockwise. So that's the C face. Okay, how about that? So, okay, so if you're using your hands, what you do is you have your thumb pointed to the face, right? So in this case, um, right? So if I was using my, my right hand, it would be one, two, three around, right? And my thumb pointed towards that face. Since I'm using my right hand, it's the ray face. Just like if I'm using my right hand, it's the R face. The here, it's the ray face, right? So the ray actually is short for rectum. Okay. 
if I'm using, right, from looking down below, right, I'm looking at the bot at the other one, right, so it's going up, something like that. So in this case, I, I'm interested in the face that, that's um, face towards the floor, away from the camera, right, so it'd be coming up like this, so it'd be a one, two, three, since I'm using the, um, the uh, since I'm using the, uh, my left hand, it's considered the C face, or sinister, it's short for sinister of face, something like that. So, there you go. So if you're using, if you just want to look at clockwise, counterclockwise, right, the, which face you look, as you're looking for it, that's the face, right, it's cl clockwise or versus counterclockwise, um, ray versus C. If you want to use your thumb method, it, your hand points toward, your, excuse me, your thumb points toward the face of interest, okay, as that, as that arrow goes in, so like that, so. Okay, for, for SP3, what you do is you say, okay, what would happen if we, if we made, right, so here, what, right, so there's no chiral, there's no chiral centers here, right, because this carbon has two different hydrogens, right, but what if we changed that to a deuterium or made it like well, that special carbon, right, so like that. So if we made this one here a, um, a deuterium or a special hydrogen or something like that, we made that the three, okay, and this, and this molecule became R, uh, an R configuration, we would then say that that's the pro R. The other one, again, if we made that one the, the, the the three priority, and it became S, right? We would say that's the pro, uh, the pro S. The nice thing is, right? If you have the pro R, then the other one has to be pro S, right? So, so you can always you can cut your, cut your work in half, right? So like that. So okay. So we're, this is how we're gonna work. Okay. Okay. So here we go. So, so you have arrows, right? So which one's the pro R? Which one's the pro S? Okay. So here we go. So we have a carbon of interest, right? So O H, right? C, O H, right? So this one's going forward. Right, so we have this one coming forward, and this one coming back. Okay, so, right, so so here's the price, right? So we're gonna do the priorities, right? So, so right from this carbon, right, we have that oxygen versus this carbon, right? Doesn't matter about this rest of the stuff, right? This oxygen is directly attached to it. So this becomes one, this becomes two, and then we have to compare this one and this one, right? Which one's three, which one's four, okay? Usually what I'll do is I'll say, okay, well, for the steering wheel method, right, we want the four to be behind, right? Um, so, hey, let's make this four, right? So it makes our lives a little easier, right? So we'll make this three, okay? So if you rewrite these as one, two, three, four, like that, okay? It's going this way, right? Like that, with four going behind, right? It's going, it's going counterclockwise. So this configuration, right? So that means this one becomes S, when we make it the three, so that means that that's the pro S. If that's the pro S, then this one has to be the pro R. All right? There you go. And you go ahead and do, you know go ahead and try it on your own. But yeah, it, this would if you made this one the three instead and that one the four, the, the molecule becomes R. So that means that this one has the pro R. Okay. So for the for the faces, right? So we have this one here. We have this methyl group coming off on the back. Right, we have this one, this CH2 group, um, going to an H, right? So, so here's our groups, right? So we have this carbon, this carbon, this carbon, right? So, so we go one, right? So this carbon versus carbon, right? So, but this one here, right? This one is um, has one carbon-carbon bond, right? And three carbon hydrogens. This one here has uh, has one carbon-carbon. Two carbon hydrogens, right? But also it has one carbon oxygen, right? So you compare the heaviest, right? This carbon carbon bond versus this carbon oxygen. Oxygen's heavier, right? So this becomes two versus three, right? So, um, so here you go. So you have one, three, two, right? So this face here, right? So it's going to go like that. Right, so when you're looking down at it, right, it's going clockwise. When you're looking down from the camera, right, so so that means this is the ray phase. If that's the ray phase, then this has to be the C phase. Okay, so if you're doing it with your thumbs, right, so your thumb points towards the 
how the arrow is going. So it's going down, right? So it's one, two, and then three's back, three's back, right? So one's over here, and then two's out at you, and then around, okay? So, okay. so one, two, okay? So like that. Okay, so there we go. So that's the C, that's the right. So they are, so that's the pro S, and that's the pro R. Okay, so chirality in nature. Okay, so we said this is exceedingly important um, in nature because there's a reason why, right? Your your hands are chiral, right? The non superimposed. Well, also your gloves are chiral as well, right? So you, um, right. So the, if you have your right and left hand glove, right? They're they're also mirrored. Right, but there's a reason why right? Right? your right hand glove fits on your right hand. Right, if you ever put your left hand glove on your right hand, right, you're two different chiral molecules interacting with each other. Right, one fits and one doesn't. Right, so it's exceedingly important that that molecule, you know, so chiral molecules are going to interact differently with different chiral molecules. Okay, and again, we talked about the the limoline, right, the citrus versus the pine, but you also see this with with carbone, right? So it, the um, the L version. Okay, actually smells like caraway, which is rye. Um, the plus version actually smells like spearmint. Okay, kind of that sweet, sweet smell. Okay, with amino acids, right? The L version, the asparagine, has a sweet taste, right? Because the, the receptors in your tongue are, are made of protein, so they're chiral. Um, but the, the D version, right, actually has a bitter taste to it. Okay, now it can also have exceedingly, it can be exceedingly important in medicine too. So this is the famous, this is one of the famous cases of of thalidomide, all right? So this drug was um, developed for, as a sedative to help pregnant women um, during, with morning sickness, okay? And so what they did is they didn't think it was ethical to, to test this on pregnant women, so they tested it on men. This was in the 1950s. Um, so they tested it on men, just fine, so like that. So they gave it to, to women, um, so like that, luckily, um, so like that. But it turns out that the, the, the molecule itself, what they made was actually the racemic fission, right? So we had it with the R and the S. The R is actually active, uh, and it actually it's a good sedative, right? Something like that. But it turns out the R, the S version, is um, what's called a teratogen, which gives birth defects. So like that. So, so what was happening is we were able, they were able to figure out that mothers that were given um, thalidomide, um, like that. so the um, they ended up giving birth to um, to babies with um, without limbs. So like that. It was, it was pretty amazing um, pictures, and not in a good way. Um, so like that, and they were able to figure out that, that those that were giving this massive spike in these types of birth defects correlated with the uh, the use of thalidomide. So like that. So now, now the question is, you know, why why don't you just make isolate the R version of thalidomide, right, and give it to that? Since that that's not a tragedy. The problem is, remember we were talking about nitrogen being able to invert its stereocenter, right? So so this nitrogen in the body is actually able to interconvert back to here. So even if you get the S version, it'll end up converting in the body to both the racemic mixture, so you'll have some S produced, right? So um, so, that, so this drug is actually still on the market, but not obviously for, uh, for pregnant women. Um, it's actually a good uh, for leprosy, but there's huge warnings about, you know, pregnancies, things like that. There's actually another drug, I think, that's treat, used to treat acne um, that also has a similar effect, right? It's a teratogen. So you have to, like, for um, women have to take a birth control test every single month to make sure that they're not pregnant. Um, so, that, so there's strict controls on who can take this. But again, it's, it's one of those things where you have to be very careful about this. And um, fewer and fewer drugs are um, are uh, receiving mixtures, right? Because you want to know that exactly what it is that you're, that you're taking. So, okay. Thank you.